So, uh, my name is Rebecca Alexa. Uh, this is Pacific Northwest Mushroom Hunting. So, a little bit about me. Um, I am a certified Oregon Master Naturalist, although a lot of that applies over here on the Washington side because the eco regions are the same on both sides of the river. So, um, I teach a number of citizen level natural history classes. So, I teach foraging classes. I teach uh, a lot of nature identification classes, bird watching, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then some things like you know, I have a class on lichens and another one on how to raise chickens. So basically it's kind of, kind of things that I think are fun and that I know enough about to put together a decent class about and, and help people kind of get started with some of the things that I've been crazy about for years. So this is one of my favorite topics to teach. We're going to be talking about mushroom hunting in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we're going to be talking about identifying, a little bit about preparation, not a ton, uh, but some other stuff about edible fungi in our region. Now, I live out on the coast out in Long Beach, and so, you know, the variety that I find this time of year there may be a little bit different than what you find here inland, but that's okay. A lot of what we're going to be talking about here, I'm not just going to be spending much time, um, you know, I, I will give you some example mushrooms later on. But we're not going to spend the whole class saying this is a morel, this is a chanterelle, this is an oyster mushroom, blah, 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 blah. That is what these are for. Field guides. Field guides. Um, so that's what you need if you just want to go and look at pictures of mushrooms, etc. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be giving you skills and tools that you can use to, you know what, there's not very many people in here. I'm just going to take this one. <sighs> there. Okay. So, um, I want to give you skills and tools that you can use wherever you go to go looking for mushroom hunting. Even though a lot of the references are going to be Northwest specific, the basic stuff I'm going to give you, you can take that. I go back to the Midwest to visit my folks a couple times a year. Uh, you can take it and go down to the South, you go to the Northeast, wherever. Um, because you're basically starting at the same point of, I have no idea what this is, how do I figure it out? So that's a lot of what we're going, to go, going into, okay? All right, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'll stop every so often, and ask a few questions, and at that point, you know, I'll answer your question and keep going. Uh, if I'm confusing you at some point, just toss your hand up if you need me to clarify, et cetera, that's fine. Otherwise, just hang on to it till the Q&A, okay? All right. So, our itinerary. Why look for edible mushrooms? We're going to look at a few things that you can get out of mushroom hunting besides the mushrooms themselves. We'll talk a lot about identifying mushrooms, how to go through it, what you're trying, to, what you're looking at, and what clues you can use to try and figure out what's edible and what's not. Uh, well, what it is, and then determine whether it's edible. Let me, let me clarify that. Uh, are they safe to eat? Really important thing. All mushrooms are edible once. <laughs> you want the mushrooms, you can safely eat multiple times, okay? Uh, again, we will look at some beginner-friendly species and some poisonous ones you want to avoid. Uh, foraging ethically and legally, we'll go a little bit into preservation, other considerations, etc. Then we'll go into further resources like your book recommendations, websites, etc. Final Q&A and wrap-up. Also, there's a lot of information here. You're welcome to take notes. If you want the PowerPoint, Grab my card at the end of the class, email me, I will happily email you the PowerPoint we're using today. So that way you don't have to write down everything verbatim, okay? All right. So, quick disclaimer, I am Wash Google Library and Fort Vancouver Regional Libraries are not responsible for any mishaps, injuries, illnesses, or deaths that result from you eating something that you shouldn't. Always be 110% sure you know what you're about to eat is edible. I'm gonna say that again and again and again until you're sick of hearing it, I don't care. It's one of the most important takeaways of this whole class. If you're trying something for the first time, always try a small amount first because even commonly edible mushrooms can make certain people sick, kind of like some folks have gluten intolerances or dairy allergies or whatever. Occasionally an edible mushroom will just make somebody a little not okay. Also, not going to be talking about mood altering mushrooms like psilocybin. I'm not qualified to speak on them because I'm boring. Uh, they add another layer of risk and complication, and they're currently 
federally illegal. Um, so sticking strictly to those culinary mushrooms. So some benefits of mushroom hunting. Learn about local nature. Mushrooms do not grow in a vacuum. Unless you haven't cleaned your vacuum in a while, you definitely don't want to eat those mushrooms. <laughs> uh, generally speaking, your edible mushrooms grow in a, in a complete ecosystem with other living beings. And just going out to find those mushrooms is automatically going to teach you some cool things about nature. Good example, mycorrhizal relationships. Myco means fungus. Rhizo means root. And so uh, let's take a little step back here. Fungal biology, fungal anatomy. So you see the mushroom. We're going to take a little picture of that later on. But you got your mushroom above ground. That is just the temporary reproductive structure of the fungus. The fungus is primarily made of something called mycelium. Mycelium is made of these little filaments called hyphae with little hairs, and they all wrap in together with each other, and they permeate, they grow through whatever substrate that particular species of fungus likes. So it could be dirt, it could be rotting wood, it could be manure, it could be compost, bark chips, you know, that thing you left in your fridge last week that Nobody's had the bravery to go look at the top where and see what it is. Yeah, that's fungus too. That's all my cellular. So that's the main body of your fungus. And then, like I said, the mushroom is the temporary reproductive structure. Pops up, hangs out for a few days to a few weeks, dies down again. So what this has to do with mycorrhizal relationships, the mycelium of some fungi will wrap themselves around the roots of certain plants, not just any plant. They have certain partners that they like. And it just so happens, for our purposes, though some of our edible mushrooms are mycorrhizal with certain trees. Trees are big, easy to notice, so a really good marker. So as you're learning about different mushrooms, you know, if you pick up any of these guides here, and you know, you're going to see, the author's going to say, hey, this species is mycorrhizal with these trees. It's usually going to be trees, occasionally other plants, but usually trees are the big, easy to notice markers. So they, again, they only have certain partners. You know, I mainly find king bolites around pine trees. Sometimes other conifers, but mostly I find them in, among different types of pine trees. Um, lobster mushrooms are another one I find around pines, but chanterelles, the Pacific Gold Chantrell out on the coast, I most likely find it next to hemlocks because they have that mycorrhizal relationship. Because what they're doing, the, the mycelium and the roots are sharing nutrients with each other. Your fungus is doing its decomposer thing, breaking down decaying matter in the soil, feeding some of those nutrients. Do come on in. Um, you know, feeding some of those nutrients to the tree. The tree is doing its photosynthesizer thing, turning sunlight, and all that sunlight out there, into sugar and feeding it to the fungus. So, just by learning about mushrooms, you're already learning about that relationship that they have with these really cool trees. And so that interconnection, does that make sense? Okay, we're getting a little busier in here, so I'm gonna go ahead and pop this back on in case we get any more folks in here. So um, that's one benefit, is just getting to learn about that ecosystem that they're with. Also, health. Generally speaking, edible mushrooms are healthy for you. They don't have a lot of calories. They don't have much in the way of fat. They don't have cholesterol. They do have a lot of good dietary fiber. They have some minerals and vitamins and other nutrients. So they're generally pretty healthy for you. Also, the act of going out mushroom hunting is healthy. You're getting outside, you're moving around, you're exploring, you're engaging your senses and your mind, and you don't have to be, you do not have to be that person who goes 15, 20 miles in a day, out in the backwoods, looking for mushrooms, getting up at like three in the morning to get to the woods by dawn. You don't have to be that person. You can if you want to, but you can also be that person like me, just kind of moseys along, through the woods, wherever I have to be, just kind of see if I happen to notice anything because I'm going along. So you can take it at your own pace. You're welcome to sit and rest as much as you want to. And you can go for as long or as short as you want, okay? 
So health, exercise at your own speed. Food security. Food security is just knowing where and how you're going to acquire food. Now, for most of us, we just go to the grocery store and get the food we want. But maybe you don't live in a place that has easy access to a grocery store. Maybe you're out in the middle of nowhere. Maybe you live in the middle of a city that has a food desert. A food desert is just an area that does not have a grocery store within easy reach. Maybe you don't have a lot of money. And so going out and being able to pick several pounds of edible mushrooms could be a really important part of your food security. Another thing, cultural heritage. So the dominant culture in the United States, most people in the United States are what we call fungi phobic. They're terrified of eating any mushroom that didn't show up wrapped in cellophane at the grocery store. You know, and so they didn't, they didn't have this whole mushroom hunting, go out in the woods, pick mushrooms, figure out which one's edible, which one's not. No, if it didn't show up at the grocery store or on a pizza, I'm not gonna bother with it. And that's okay. But thankfully we have a lot of funky feeling cultures, cultures where for generations and generations and generations had people who just, that's what you do. You go out with your family, you carry it on to the next generation and they carry it on to their kids, et cetera, et cetera where to find mushrooms, how to figure out which one's edible or not, et cetera, et cetera. So thankfully, because we have these funky feeling cultures who are willing to share that information, we have a lot of what we know about the edible mushrooms. You know, so we don't have to, you know, send random person out, hey, try that mushroom, see what it does to you. <laughs> We've already got that amazing information, okay? Finally, it's fun. You know, there are a lot of people who say, oh, gee, I got to go out and go mushroom hunting. I got to take this bucket with me and into the woods and look for the mushrooms. Blah, blah, blah. You know, maybe if you're some kid who's being forced to go along with their family and you don't really want to, you want to stay home and play video games. Okay, fine. But most people are going to have fun going out and having mushroom, going, going mushroom hunting. Even the kid who wants to be out uh, video gaming. You know, eventually a lot of them are like, yeah, I really had a great time once they're awake and okay about it. Okay? So, these are the few of the benefits besides the mushrooms themselves. Even if you don't find any mushrooms, you still got all that stuff out of, out of the uh, experience. Okay? All right. What do I need for identification? What do you want to take out in the field? Field guides. Like I said, I have a few samples here that I really like. There's so many more out there. If you need recommendations beyond this, let me know. I collect field guides. It's kind of an addiction at this point. So, you know, I'm more than happy to give you uh, recommendations. Um, what you're going to find is that you're not going to take the whole entire collection with you. So that's impossible. You know, I would be dragging a wagon of books with me if I was carrying the whole library. But what I do have is a couple of them that I really, really like. Usually... These two are two of my favorites right now that I like taking out with me. But then what I do is when I get home, I'll double check with all the others and websites and other stuff. So, but you're going to find you have a couple that you really like. Take those with you and let them be sort of your first tool in helping you figure that out, okay? All right. Um, smartphone. Really wonderful tool to have. You get lost. Fall off a cliff, hey, you can call for help as long as you have signal. Uh, I do recommend that if you're going to go someplace way out in the middle of nowhere, that you also have something like a spot beacon or other emergency beacon, just in case, especially if you're going by yourself. Um, but the nice thing about that smartphone, if you have signal, you can access websites. Uh, if you think you know what mushroom you have, but you want to have some pictures to compare it to, just search online. And then look at the image results. If you think you found a chicken in the woods, search chicken in the woods, look at the image results, compare it to that mushroom you're looking at right there. Does it look like it? Hey, that's a point favor of being that mushroom. Okay. Um, Ebooks. Ebooks are a fabulous tool. Um, if your favorite field guides come in ebook format, buy the ebook, download it, put it on your phone, and hey, your phone doesn't weigh any more than it did before. Wonderful tool. 
IDX. I have a love hate relationship with IDX because, on the one hand, they're a super tool for your first sort of first round of identification. So I love iNaturalist. I'm going to actually do a, a demo of it for you in a moment. But um, iNaturalist is a great tool because you can take a picture of something and it'll give you suggestions of what it thinks it is. Unfortunately, you have a lot of people who don't go further than the app. And that's how poisonings happen. Apps are great. They're not perfect. Hand lens or magnifying glass. So you want to have a thing to magnify what you're looking at because maybe you're going to be looking for little bitty structures or patterns on the mushroom that can help you with identification. We're going to look at a few examples of that later on. Maybe you're like me, your eyes just aren't as good as they used to be, so it helps to have that little bit of extra magnification. I just got my first uh, progressive lenses a few months ago. So yeah, seeing up close, eh, nice to have that little bit of extra, extra vision there. You want to have something to carry the mushrooms home in. So, you can have a bucket, you can have a basket, you can have a backpack, but my favorite thing is a mesh bag. A mesh bag. This can be a laundry bag, it can be a produce bag, doesn't matter. As long as the holes are big enough that you can see them with the naked eye, but not so big that your mushrooms fall out. And the reason for this, when you're walking down the trail and you've got this bag of mushrooms, you're basically jostling those mushrooms and you're shaking spores out. That is what a mushroom is for. It is the reproductive structure. It grows up. It spreads spores. Spores are kind of sort of analogous to plant seeds, but not really. But they do start the new generation of fungi. So if you've got your mushrooms in a solid bottom bucket, those spores aren't going anywhere except the bottom of the bucket. But if you're carrying that bag, you're dropping spores everywhere you go. That's not a guarantee that you'll find those mushrooms there you know, next year, but better chance if you have them in a bucket. Uh, gloves. Gloves are a great thing to have. You know, maybe you're going to be grubbing around in the undergrowth. Maybe you're going to be, you know, climbing over rocks and things. Just good to have something to protect your hands. Now, this does bring me to a common misconception about mushrooms. What happens? Let's say there's a destroying angel mushroom right there. One of the most poisonous mushrooms in the world. And I have my bare hand, and I pick it, and I'm holding it. And I carried it around with me all day. And I didn't, know it was a, I didn't know it was the most poisonous mushroom in the world. Am I going to die? No. 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 Fungi are not plants. This isn't something like poison oak where it's got, a, it's got a, a, an oil on it that's irritating to the skin. It's not, you know, no little thorns and things. The toxins are within the cells of the mushroom, of the fungus. And the only way I can actually bite a piece off of that mushroom, chew it up, spit it out. It's not going to hurt me. The only way it's going to hurt me is if I swallow and digest enough of it for the toxins to work their way into my system. In this case, the, the amatoxins and the phallotoxins in your destroying angel would start dissolving my liver. They cause cell death. Nasty stuff. So, gloves are great for protecting you from things like sticks and thorns and angry insects. But you don't have to worry about the mushrooms, okay? Uh, also, you want to have, of course, weather and terrain appropriate clothing and footwear. Uh, check your forecast before you go out. If you're going to go someplace that has anything more rugged than a sidewalk, yeah, at the very least, you want to wear tennis shoes, hiking boots if you got them. Now, what's not on that list? A mushroom knife. So, a mushroom knife is a little tool. That day long-ish, has a little curved blade. You see a lot of mushroom hunters using them. There's a big debate among mushroom fans as to whether you should pull or cut a mushroom. And I ended up doing a bunch of reading on this because I was really curious. And they've actually done studies. They've had one patch of mushrooms that they only pull and one patch that they only cut. There's almost no difference in how many mushrooms each patch uh, produce year after year 
wasn't as cold a cut. In fact, the cold one had a slightly better number of mushrooms popping up. So really, it's up to personal preference. Some people like to use a mushroom knife because they don't like the dirt on the end of the mushroom. I mean, you can see this peeled off, middle it off with the knife, and you have a little bit more you know, fungus to eat, a little more mushroom to eat. Um, but if you don't want to deal with it, fine, cut it off. The one thing I do want to mention is if your mushroom is kind of buried in some duff and stuff on the ground, you know, high noodles, leaves, stuff like that, and you cut it off at the surface, you might be missing an important structure that's just at the surface of the ground or just underneath. So that's one of the reasons that I like to get my fingers down and really get a good hold and pull the whole thing up. Now, it's not like a plant. You know, if you got a mushroom that tall, that big around, you know, you might pull up a little bit of the mycelium. The, by, by the whole mycelium is like maybe sometimes several feet around that one mushroom. So it's not like a plant where you rip up a whole plant, roots and all, and the plant dies. You know, your mushrooms will grow back because the bulk of the mycelium is left in the soil or the rotting wood, okay? All right, I've been blabbing at you folks for a while. Anybody have any questions so far? Questions, thoughts, confusions? Okay, good, I think. So, a special note on iNaturalist. I should have logged in earlier. Let's see if I remember my uh, password here. So, iNaturalist is a really awesome uh, app. It's free, which is great. You can put it on any single, uh, put on any app, or on any kind of smartphone you want. Doesn't matter whether it is iPhone, Android, whatever. Please tell me I didn't change my password. Haha! -ha, yay! No, do not say. Which means I probably need to change my password. So, iNaturalist is an awesome app. Um, you can use it either on your phone or on a browser. It's going to look different on the browser versus the phone just because of the size of the screen, the way things are configured for phones, et cetera, et cetera. So when you first log in on your browser, it gives you this really cool kind of social media type feed. Uh, if you log in on your phone, regardless of what phone it is, the first thing it's going to bring up is going to be the upload page because it assumes that, you, that you're opening up the app so you can take it to your home and take a picture of something and figure out what it is, okay? But I just want to show you a few features, uh, particularly some that are going to be useful for mushroom hunting. So you can follow people, places, and things. Uh, I follow my home county that I grew up in in Missouri, and I follow my county that I live in now in Washington. This is kind of cool to see what kind of stuff people are finding there. Uh, I follow other people, so it's always kind of fun to see what other people are uh, you know, looking at that's really the great thing about iNaturalist is it's a very user interactive app compared to most other um, identification apps. Let's see. We're going to narrow this down to my content. So I demonstrate something that's really useful. Okay, here we go. Perfect. So, close this real quick here. Um, not too long ago, like last weekend, I took a picture of this plant because I didn't quite really recognize it. Um, and by the way, animals, plants, fungi, slime molds, if it's alive and you can take a picture of it, you can put it on that natural. People even take pictures of things they're looking at under microscopes and put it on iNaturalist. So it's a really cool app to identify all kinds of fun stuff. Um, so we're looking at a plant here just because it's the first one that popped up. So when I first opened the app and took the photo, what you're actually going to put in is you're going to have the photo. And for mushrooms, you actually want to have three different views of your mushroom. You're taking your photo. And this work, this, this is for any app that does mushrooms, not just iNaturalist. You want three views. You have the top view. You're walking along. You see a mushroom. I've got to look at that. Lean over take a picture. That is your bird's eye view. Then if you can, hunker down on the ground and get a picture of it from the side, like you're a rabbit standing, sitting on the ground, looking straight on this mushroom. That's your bunny side view. And then you might get a picture of the underside of it. You might stick your phone under there, or you might just take a mushroom, turn it upside down, 
take a picture of it. The structure that that mushroom has underneath the cap is really important for figuring out what kind of mushroom you have. And that is your bug's eye view. So you want your bird's eye view, your bunny's eye view, and your bug's eye view, okay? All right, so we have, that makes our visual data, our picture of pictures. Your phone should automatically put in the date and the time. That's your seasonal data. And that should also put in your GPS coordinates automatically. That is your location data. You can also do that manually if your phone's not cooperating. So visual data, seasonal data, location data. Using those P three pieces of data, I naturalist, if you click on, and we'll take a look at this in a minute. If you click on a species name or what did you see or wherever the area that you put, you know, what you think it is. If you just click on it, don't type anything, just click on it. it the, the algorithms will kind of sift through um, observations that have similar photos at a similar time of year in that general area. And it'll use those to give you suggestions. Because there's something like 133 million and, and counting observations uploaded to iNaturalist's database at this point. So they got a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to sift through at this point. So that's one of the reasons that makes it such a powerful uh, app is because it has all that data behind it. So it's going to give you that initial suggestion. And so youth on age was a thing that was suggested to me as, you know, what this plant is. And I did a little bit of reading on, on, online. I was in the middle of a class, so I couldn't really, you know, do a bunch of research at the time. But it looked pretty similar to what I thought it would be. So I'm like, okay, I'll just pick that. And then I have that time to kind of go back and look for myself. But, hey, check this out. Another iNaturalist user agrees with me that this is Tolmia menzies You know, youth on age. And what's really awesome about that, this is now research grade. Check that out. Which means if you have um, a scientist who is studying a particular thing, let's say the scientist studying whether uh, drought and climate change are causing mushrooms to pop up at a different time of year, you know, earlier or later than normal, they can use your research grade mushroom observations as part of the data, which is really, really cool. So that's just a very basic idea of how this works. Um, what I'm gonna do here real quick, I'm gonna go to, we're just gonna grab a uh, sample picture here real quick of a mushroom. Normally I do this on my own computer, so I already have a database, so bear with me here. I, it's been a while since I've done this one in person. Let's go with um, Morchella importuna, one of our mushrooms that's happening like right now. Ooh, that's a good picture. Something like that might be a little tough to get all three views, but do the best you can. Let's go put this in downloads. Okay. All right, now upload. Again, you can do this from your phone or from the browser. Picture, here we go. All right, so it's 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 kind of getting fooled because this, this picture has been floating around a while, so it might already know what it is. We're gonna go ahead and put in, like I said, if your phone doesn't automatically put in date and time, just go ahead and put it in you know, manually. And it's thinking, it's thinking, it's thinking, it's thinking. There we go. You might just have to zoom in and then zoom in a little bit more. And oh, come on. The internet's not that bad here. This is like, this is like at my place out on the coast where the internet's terrible. All right. We're just going to say we found it right here. Okay. So we have our visual data. We have our seasonal data. We have our location data. Now click on species name and let it think. Okay. Oh, hey, stop that. I didn't click one yet. There we go. So we're pretty sure it's in the genus Morchella. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, but it's also giving us a few specific species. Now, that's a really good, solid 
uh, response from iNaturalist. You don't always get this. Sometimes it says, eh, we're not sure, but it might be one of these. And then it gives you a few like completely unrelated things that kind of sort of look like what you're looking at. This is why you never want to use apps as your only tool, okay? You know, they're a great starting point, but never use it as your only thing. Now I'm gonna show you a really cool thing that's useful and you can do this in the field. Click on view. If you think it might be this thing right here, the landscaping black mor morel, the Morcello and Fortuna, click on view. On your phone, it might be two little arrows, one pointing left, one pointing right, but same thing. And so what that does is it opens up a tab with information about the species that's being recommended to you. And you can click on that and see more photos. If you want to compare the mushroom you're looking at in person to photos of that species and see if it matches. Okay, cool, we have a visual match, great. But you also have, this is really important right here, especially for mushrooms. This is a graph showing how, what time of, you know, how many are being observed, uploaded to iNaturalist in each month. And hey, April is prime time for Morcella and Fortuna. So if you found one of those outside today, that's a big point in favor of being that species. Also along those lines, uh, the about page is that imported of the uh, Wikipedia, you know, so makes it easier than going to Wikipedia. But the map, the map is really helpful because, assuming it loads here, come on. So what it should do is put a bunch of, uh, there we go. It will show you where that species has been found by iNaturalist users. Now, if, we, if the species you're considering if all the observations over here on the eastern seaboard, probably not going to be more chill and more tuna. You know, it's going to be something different. But hey, we got a ton of them over here on the west coast. Um, also, speaking of seasonality, going back to this graph for a second, some mushrooms, some fungus species will produce mushrooms off season. Like they'll have a prime time, but then maybe six months later, they'll do like a smaller flush. You know, so there's a prime season for most of them, but again, don't be, if, if, if you find something out of season, it could just be really early or really late. So don't use that to just rule it out entirely, okay? Um, the map usually is a good way to rule it out if there's nothing over here on our end, but give it a little more wiggle room with season. All right, so map, that's the Wikipedia page. We're not gonna worry about taxonomy and status. Similar species, this is also really useful because it brings up species that are commonly misidentified as the one that's being recommended to you as the ID for your mystery mushroom. And you, it's useful to look through those because you might actually see one that matches the mushroom that you have in hand more than the initial suggestion. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're gonna close that out. And we could pick, if you're not sure which species, it's totally okay to put genus. It's also totally just say, you know, it's a mushroom, that's the best I can do. And you can totally just type in fungi, including lichens. And hopefully another iNaturalist user will come along later and say, oh, I know what that is. And then they'll tell you what it is. Kind of like that other person confirmed my identification for that thing, okay? So that's another really thing that makes us so valuable for mushroom hunting is you do have that community support, okay? All right, the last cool thing I wanna show you that's really useful for mushroom hunters. The Explore tab. Now again, you can access this on your phone, but I like accessing it on a browser because it's a bigger screen. Oh, come on. Don't you die on me now. <laughs> Come on, this is like the best part. What are you doing? Oh, we seem to have lost the internet. I'm going to need a little tech help here. Oh, no, there it goes. Never mind. Okay, so let's say you absolutely want to find one particular type of mushroom. Uh, let's say next fall you want to go looking for Pacific Gold with chanterelles because you heard uh, chanterelles show up uh, in the fall and they're very tasty. So you can search for just that species and again you can do this with any species of mushroom and what it does is it brings up a map 
And what that's useful for is A, confirming that yes, that mushroom does show up here on the West Coast, but B, it shows you where people have been finding them, at least people who use iNaturalist. And actually, iNaturalist users are more likely, more likely than your average mushroom hunter to share uh, locations of, of particularly um, commercially viable mushrooms because they don't want you know, random people coming in and taking their mushroom spot. So really useful for that. So we're gonna look at this, we, got, we, got, we have a few hot spots here, like here and here and down here, but we're gonna take a look at this one right here. So if you zoom in enough, it goes from little red boxes to magenta pins. Now, some of them are semi-transparent circles. Those are ones where people have, um, not giving you the exact GPS, but they give you the general idea of where to look. But if you have one that has a magenta pin, they're telling you exactly where they found it. Now that gives you a general location. We're getting the idea that this area through here is probably a good place in the, uh, the coast range to go looking for chanterelles. But you also want to notice time, time of year, season. So that one's found in August. That's another August. There's uh, October. There's from January. So basically the second half of the year into very early January is a good time to go looking for chanterelles in that area. And so really, like I said, you can do this with any species if you're really dead set on finding one particular species and helping narrow down where to go. Now it doesn't mean that there are none here and none here, but given that we have a whole cluster of them right here and another cluster here, that might be a really good spot to go looking because there's precedent, okay? All right, any questions or thoughts? Does this make sense? Okay. Go back to our PowerPoint here, all right. So where do I go to find edible mushrooms? Well, we just looked at one option. Use your iNaturalist map to help you cheat a little bit. That's okay. Uh, but check your yard. Like I said, that Morcella Importuno we're looking at, it shows up in bark mulch. And you will get it showing up in people's landscaping. So if you have mulch in your yard, this is a good time here to kind of peek out, see if you got more else popping up. Um, also, local parks and open lots and sidewalks, you're not as likely to find uh, edible mushrooms there as you would, say, in the middle of the woods, but it's worth checking into, okay? You know, just keep your eyes open. Even if you don't find edible mushrooms, any mushroom, is a good opportunity to practice your identification skills, okay? Also, hiking trails. Once you get out more into the woods, uh, there are a lot of hiking trails out there, and they're in more complete ecosystems, so you may have better luck finding them there. Although, because some of those trails are very popular, it's likely somebody else might have come along and snagged that edible mushroom before you did. But if you go on a less popular trail, hey, you might be that lucky person. Off trail land, a lot of hardcore mushroom hunters will go off into the national and state forests, uh, BLM land, things like that. And they'll do that to go away from everybody else. You know, go to places where the land is a little more wild and there's not as much competition. So those are a few ideas. I'm not the kind of person who goes out looking for one particular type of mushroom. Unless I found it in a particular place last year, and I know I can go back this year and look. You know, I'm basically the kind of person I do it the opposite. I let any place that I go to show me what it has. Because I'm always seeing what kind of cool plants and fungi and animals and other stuff any place has. I'm just automatically going to pick up on anything that might be edible as well. Okay, does that make sense? All right. So, parts of a mushroom. These are the most common parts you're going to see referenced in your field guides and other resources. It gets more technical than that, but here's your beginning. The cap, that's the top part of your mushroom. It's the most easy, obvious thing to notice. Underneath the cap, you're going to have something called a hymenophore, which is either going to be gills, or sometimes they have pores, or sometimes they have little uh, spikes. But any, whatever, whatever it's shaped like, the thing under the cap releases those spores. And then the cap on many species is supported by a stipe. That's basically the stem of the mushroom. Some stipes will have other structures. 
the annulus, also known as the veil or the ring. So when that mushroom pushed its way out of the ground, it wasn't a big open umbrella, it was a little round ball. And the annulus is basically the remnant of a protective veil that was covering the gills, or other high metaphor, to keep it from getting damaged by rocks and dirt as the mushroom is pushing its way out of the ground. And then as the mushroom opened up with that big open umbrella, it broke open that veil, and that's basically like the the, 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 the pop the, the pop balloon left behind. Okay? Now the vulva also known as the cup. That's another protective membrane, and that basically acted like an eggshell over the entire developing mushroom as it pushed its way out of the ground. And then once it got out, it burst out and opened up. So that, of course, was produced by your mycelium made of hyphae, which just looks very little right here, but again, in actuality, it would probably extend several feet out from that mushroom, okay? All right, and again, those are just basics. Those are things you're going to see popping up in your field guides and such. Now, here's something I'm going to throw a whole bunch of information at you real quick. If it feels overwhelming, that's okay. Again, you can ask for this uh, PowerPoint if you want. So, these are things you want to look at when you have a mystery mushroom. You have no idea what it is. These are physical traits you want to keep in mind, especially if you have two very similar mushrooms that are contenders for the ID of your mystery mushroom, you got species A and species B. So, location. Where did you find this mushroom? Is it supposed to be there? Remember the map we were looking at that showed where those mushrooms are found. If species A has a whole bunch of range map here on the west coast, species B is only found on the east coast, probably not going to be species B. Season. What time of year is it? Do you normally see this mushroom pop up? Yeah, again, you do have some out of season, small amounts. But if you're seeing a whole bunch of them, this is probably its, its main season, its prime time. So if species A, prime time is right now, species B, prime time is in fall, probably not going to be species B. Size. How does the mushroom you have in front of you compare to the size range of the species it might be? If you've got a big old mushroom that's like five inches across, and species A, normal size range, four to six inches across, species B rarely exceeds three inches across, probably not going to be species B, okay? Um, shape. So this can be very general, like this mushroom is umbrella shaped. It can also be very specific details, like chanterelles have false gills shaped as though they were carved out of wax. We're going to look at that a little bit later. So you want to get the big picture, but you also want to bring out that magnifying that glass and look at those little bitty details, because there might be something important there, okay? That's what thoughts, but yeah. Is there a better time of day to go mushroom hunting? No. Okay. Whenever you can see them. Right on. Uh, colors. Sometimes the difference between two species comes down to color. So this includes the easy to see things like the cat, the stipe, et cetera, but also things like the spores. We're gonna talk about spore prints in a minute. Texture, what does this mushroom feel like? What does it look like? This mushroom looks velvety. That one looks slimy. This mushroom feels very firm. This one's kind of squishy. So feel free to touch the mushrooms. Get a good visual feel, also get a good uh, you know, get, get a good tactile feel and also get a good visual texture on them. Smell and taste. Some mushrooms have unique smell. So smell the mushroom. If you're brave, bite a piece off, chew it up, spit it out. See what the flavor is like. Some mushrooms are bitter. Some of them are very peppery and not a very pleasant sort of peppery. Some of them taste okay. Now tasting okay is not mean the mushroom is safe to eat. Destroying angels reportedly taste very good. But your liver's not going to like it when it falls apart, so don't eat those. <laughs> and finally, is the bottom edge of the cap attached to the stipe on that mushroom you were looking at a few slides ago? No, it's a big open umbrella. The, outs, the, the bottom edge of the cap is out here. But the morels, when we're looking at it right here on my shirt, 
That's a closed umbrella mushroom. The bottom edge of that cap is attached to spikes all the way around. Does it have gills? Does it have pores? Does it have something else entirely? Look at the undercarriage of your mushroom to see what's spreading the spores. Cut it open. Is it hollow or is it solid inside? You know, uh, puff balls. Puff balls are very, very happy, little popular uh, edible mushrooms. And they look like little white balls sitting on the ground. If you cut them open, they're completely solid all the way through. But a young destroying angel or death cap mushroom also looks very much like a little white ball sitting on the ground when it first pushes its way out. Which is why puff balls are not on my beginner friendly list. Now, if you cut that destroying angel open, there's going to be a little hollow at the bottom of the mushroom where you can just see the spike of the gills starting to form. But a lot of people, unfortunately, have overlooked that and got poisoned. Um, so yeah, substrate, what's it growing in? Most fungi have one preference, rotting wood, soil, manure, whatever. You do have some species that will grow in soil or rotting wood, but usually they're gonna have one preference. So pay attention to what that mushroom's growing in when you pick it. Mycorrhizal plants, we talked about that earlier in the class. Does that mushroom, do you keep seeing that species of mushroom underneath or near certain trees? That means they might have a mycorrhizal relationship. They might be connected to each other. Also pay attention, your field guides, they're often going to mention when a species has a mycorrhizal relationship. So pay attention to what trees that mushroom is growing around because if they mention that tree in here, hey, that's a point in favor of being that species, okay? Now, spore print. You can't see individual spores without a microscope, but you can see a whole bunch of them together. So what you do to make a spore print, remove the site of the mushroom, so you just have the cap. Put the cap, gills or pores side down on a white piece of paper. Printer paper works fine. Put that in a cool, dry place for 24 to 48 hours. Uh, you want to put a, a mixing bowl upside down over it to protect it from any kind of drafts or breezes that might blow the spores on. Come back after 24 or 48 hours, carefully lift your bowl, carefully lift your cap, and you should have a nice spore print showing the color of the spores. It might be brown or white or yellow or purple or green, uh, but you're not going to get a mushroom that has rainbow spores. So pay attention to that spore color because, again, your books are going to say, Spore color of that species. Uh, if you have a microscope, sure, you can look at individual spores if you want to, but you're not really going to need that for identifying most of your common edible mushrooms. Bruising, also known as staining. Some mushrooms, when you damage them, you cut them, you crush them, break them, whatever, the damaged portion after about 15 to 30 minutes changes color. Now, some bruising mushrooms are toxic. Some bruising mushrooms are edible. But if you see a mushroom bruising, it's not that common a trait. So after you cut it open to see whether it's hollow or solid inside, leave it for a half an hour, come back, has it changed color? Okay, that's going to really narrow down the number of species it could be, okay? All right, any questions or thoughts or anything? Okay, where are we at here time wise? Okay, got a quick bit of water. Are we all doing okay here? Okay, good. Can we slate this for 90 minutes? Yeah. Okay. All right, then I will not dog. I, I usually, I often do this as a two hour class, so I'm trying to kind of for anything wrong. So, quick note about lichens, because people always ask me about lichens. A lichen is actually a composite being made of a fungus and a photosynthesizer. It's either going to be an algae or cyanobacteria. And then they recently discovered a third partner, a yeast which of course is another type of fungus. And so they're really cool composite beings that, that they work together and they can do this in really uh, tough situations that fungi or plants alone couldn't live in. Now for our purposes, can you eat them? Technically, yeah, there's some that are edible, but it's basically the kind of thing you usually eat when there's nothing else. It's starvation food. There's not a lot of nutrients, they're kind of tough and springy, so 
Not really the kind of thing most people are going to go out of the way to eat. Oh, yeah, good call. Thank you. Do we need to move the uh, thing? workshop and I don't know enough about it to talk about it but if you're interested it's worth looking into all right I know what it is can I eat it that's a $64,000 question all right so if I'm not 120% sure I can safely eat something usually because it's something I've eaten before and I didn't die uh, the first thing I do is I talk to other foragers about it um, I know people online I know people in person if you don't know anybody that's okay you know me now Feel free to email me. I'm also going to recommend some online groups later. Uh, I also check my field guides and other books, websites, blogs, basically as many resources as I possibly can. And check when resources are published. One of the books I do not have up here, but I do recommend it later on, is David Aurora's All That the Rain Promises and More. It's a great little pocket guide. It's got solid information. But it was last published in 1991. Hasn't been updated since then. And some of the scientific things have changed. Um, but also, occasionally, you will get a mushroom that used to be considered edible that is no longer considered to be edible. Good example angel wing mushrooms. For decades, they've been considered edible. They look a lot like oyster mushrooms, uh, but they're a little flimsier, uh, thinner, they're not as common. Usually if you find something that looks like a big, you know, white fan sticking out of a tree, probably going to be an oyster mushroom. Anyway, angel wing mushrooms long considered to be edible until a few years ago, a bunch of people in Japan ate angel wing mushrooms and got sick. Several dozen of them got sick and 17 of them died from eating this mushroom that was considered to be commonly edible. Now it did turn out later that a lot of them ended up having kidney issues that contributed to that. That's not the way I want to find out that I have a kidney issue I didn't know about. <laughs> so I just, personally, I put angel wing mushrooms in the do not eat category because of that. And again, that happened after some of these field guides were last released, okay? So check as many resources as you can because you're gonna find information like that online, studies, etc. All right, best practice. Uh, if it is not described by other foragers as being poisonous, and it doesn't give you an external reaction. That's a very, very rare thing, usually with people who have a sensitivity to fungi in general. Um, cook and eat a small amount, like just a few bites. Not a whole plateful, a few bites. And then see what your body does over the next couple of days. Usually if something's going to make you sick, it's going to do so in the first 12 hours. And you will know it. You'll gastrointestinal upset and you'll be miserable. Now, some fungi have delayed reactions. You're destroying an angel, that nasty, poisonous one. Yeah, it'll give you the initial gastrointestinal upset. And after a few days, you start feeling better. And then about a week later, you end up in the hospital with acute liver failure because the toxins never left your body. And it took that long for your liver to just fall apart in that way. Okay? So be cautious. If you have a small reaction because you ate a small amount, it's better than having a big reaction because you ate a large amount. Okay? And again, remember, even fungi that are deemed edible by the experts can still disagree with certain people's digestive systems. Now, there's a myth. That if you see another animal eating a fungus, it must be safe for you. Look at those. Those are cute. They look like little red bean paste rolls. They're adorable. And hey, you can see where a slug has been eating them. That means it's safe for me to eat, right? No. Those are sulfur tufts. Those don't make me throw up a whole bunch. So just like we can eat certain things that other animals can't, some animals can eat things we can't. We have different body chemistry, different digestive systems, different toxin 
uh, tolerances, etc. So, do not use I saw an animal eat it as proof. Raw versus cooked. Real quick, cook your wild mushrooms. There are a few that can be eaten raw, but generally speaking, you're going to want to cook them first. I don't know if anything goes the other way around where it's safe raw, but toxic cooked, because cooking tends to uh, neutralize toxins. A note on alcohol for anybody who drinks. There are a few edible mushrooms that have compounds in them that mix badly with alcohol. Uh, it's like having a really bad chemistry experiment happening in your stomach, so no way. Uh, we know that ACAP and some of the other coprinopsis species have something called coprine in them, and that's the thing that makes those not do well with alcohol. Anecdotally, these others also do not play well with alcohol. Now, I don't drink, but if I did, I would not drink alcohol 24 hours before or after eating any of these mushrooms. I also wouldn't cook them with alcohol just in case I didn't cook the alcohol off of all the way. Okay? All right, be forewarned. So, if something makes you sick, obviously, if you're having really severe symptoms, like, um, You know, pretty nasty vomiting, blood coming out of various orifices, uh, neurological symptoms, trouble breathing, things like that, you know, go to the hospital. It's better to err on the side of safety. Um, if you're kind of feeling in, or if someone is taking you to the hospital, or someone is doing research for you while you're being taken to the hospital, poison control. There's their phone number, there's a website, they've dealt with stuff a lot, they can help you figure out if this is something to worry about. Uh, one thing to do, if you're if you're collecting a new type of mushroom, never try eating more than one new type of mushroom at a time. So that way if you get sick, you don't have to guess which one made you sick. And when you have that new type of mushroom, take one of them. Don't cut it up, don't cook it, take it exactly as you found it in nature, Stick it in the fridge, forget about it. And then when you cook your little sample, if it makes you sick, grab that sample, you grab the one out of the fridge, take it to the hospital with you, and that will help the medical professionals figure out what you ate so they can treat you that much more quickly, okay? Uh, real quick, we're just going to go through a few edible Pacific Northwest mushrooms. This is just a little sampling. Uh, we do have a lot of others. But these are the ones that are pretty, they're pretty distinctive, and they don't have a lot in the way of super dangerous, deadly look likes, okay? And again, always make sure you're 100% sure you know what you eat before you eat it. Oyster mushrooms, I mentioned those earlier. Uh, the pictures are not very good here because it just doesn't do as well on a projector, but again, I can send you this later, or you just Google pictures of oyster mushrooms. So. They grow on hardwood trees, not softwood. So they grow on things like your maple, alder, not on conifers. Uh, and they generally grow on dead or dying trees, not perfectly healthy live ones, because they're, they're detritivores. Uh, they smell like licorice. So if you stick your nose in a bunch of those oyster mushrooms, you get a little faint whiff of black licorice. It's very interesting. They grow in clusters rather than one here, one here, one here. White to gray on top with white with uh, white gills underneath. Not the same as the golden oyster mushroom. You might see mushroom growing kits. If you see a golden oyster mushroom kit, that's a totally different uh, edible mushroom. And in fact, the oyster mushrooms are some of the easiest ones to grow if you want to give that a try. Sometimes these are called blue oysters. Um, generally, the oysters fruit the most commonly in the fall. But you will also find some spring and summer. I found a bunch of them on some maple trees last weekend. Pacific Golden Chanterelle, that's one we were looking at on the map earlier. Um, so you can kind of see here, these have very thick, chunky, false gills. So they look kind of like they've been carved out of wax or wood. Whereas on your false chanterelle there, they, those have true gills. I know it's kind of confusing. Don't blame me. I didn't name them. But the true gills are closer together. They look kind of like pages in a book. They're very thin and they're very tightly packed. So don't eat the false chanterelle. It'll make you sick. Do eat the true chanterelle. Look for those false gills. They're not as deep. Again, they look like somebody carved them 
into the side of the, of the mushroom, okay? So they grow on soil, not on logs or trees. We're gonna look at a lookalike that grows on dead wood uh, a little later that's poisonous. Have those false gills that come partway down the stipe. Uh, several chanterelle species, they all look about the same, just different colors, all are considered edible. And they generally start fruiting in midsummer and into fall. Again, this is a lot of information. Let me know, and I'm happy to send you this PowerPoint afterwards. Uh, morels, we were looking at those earlier. So these are the ones that are, you know, in season right now. These also grow at the same time. Notice that they're completely hollow inside when you cook, when you cut them open. They have kind of a honeycombed appearance. Often they're kind of cone shaped, although there's some variation. This is a false morel. That will make you sick. Looks kind of like a pile of grains or, or worms. Um, and if you cut it open, it's either going to be solid or it's got a bunch of little chambers rather than that one nice hollow of your morels. So again, true morels, hollow inside, honeycombed appearance. Caps tend to be cone shaped. Several species exist. They're often grouped by color, uh, black, yellow, white morels, etc. Morchella importuna, which is a black morel, often found in mulch in urban areas. So keep your eyes peeled. Uh, places that have burned in the last year or two. There are a bunch of mushroom hunters out there right now in some of those areas out in the Cascades that burned last year because the, the morels uh, fire adaptation is after burn, make as many mushrooms as possible to spread as many spores as you can. And again, spring is prime morel hunting time right now. All right, chicken in the woods. Looks like a giant pile of orange and yellow pancakes exploding out of a tree. Uh, they will grow on both hardwood and softwood trees. Pick the ones on hardwoods, not on conifers. Con the ones on conifers are a little more likely to give people digestive upset. Uh, very distinctive. Um, there is one species where the, cut, the orange is more pale and the yellow parts are more of a cream. Uh, generally, it's going to fruit summer to fall, so you got a few more months before they start showing up. Pick them when they're younger. The older they get, they get tough, and, and you can't really cook that out of them. Uh, again, lots of debate as to whether chicken on woods on, on conifers can cause upset stomachs, or if it's just one particular species. So just be a little more cautious when you're trying chicken in the woods for the first time, especially if you do try to eat one that was growing on like a Douglas fir or something. King Bolit, also known as the porcini. This is a big mushroom. The cap can be this big across. It's a big thing. Looks kind of like a roll or a bun on a big, thick stalk. It's a little hard to see it, but if you look really closely at the stipe on one of these, there's a pattern on it called reticulation, and it looks like a white netting stretched over a brown background. It's very specific to that species. So if you see that on a big, chunky mushroom like this, Good, it's a good indicator, it's a king bleat. And it does not have gills, it has spongy pores on the underside. Now, I don't like the texture of the pores, they're really chewy and boingy. So what I do is I will actually cut the cap in half this way, and I'll take the top half of the cap and the stipe, and I'll just chop them up and put them in whatever recipe I'm doing. And I take the uh, pores, and I'll slice them very thin this way, as thin as I can. And I run through a food dehydrator until they crack or dry. They snap when I try to break them. And I run that through a coffee grinder that I just have for mushrooms. And then that makes a powder that's really good as a soup base. Mm -hmm. Or if you do meat, uh, it's good for a, a base for a meat rub. So look for that fine mesh-like pattern. The pores can be white or yellow. Um, it does not bruise blue when cut. There are some members of the genus Boletus that will bruise blue when you cut them, and uh, those all happen to be toxic. Looks a little bit like a roll or a bun on a big, thick stipe. Uh, older Boletes are prone to getting worms and insects. I mean, within a few days, they start getting bugs in them. So this is another one you want to pick sooner rather than later. And it likes growing under conifers in the fall. Uh, occasionally, you'll start seeing them in the latter half of summer. 
Shaggy mane, very distinctive, has those kind of flippy bits up there. Um, if you cut it open, the cap is solid, the stipe is hollow. And these like dirt, but they also like manure. I live out on a farm that a couple of my friends own. And we get a bunch of them growing in the barnyard every year because they like the animal manure from them all running around there. So look for the peeling bits on the cap and that hollow stem. Looks very similar to inky cap, which is another edible. It just has a smoother cap, not little shaggy bits. Now, the way that these, um, the way they spread their spores is really unique. So starting at the bottom edge of the cap, when the mushroom is mature, it starts turning black and gooey. And as it does that, it's basically curling up and spreading those gills open and letting those spores out. And eventually this becomes this pile of black goo on the end of a stalk. Now, it just so happens that picking a, picking a shaggy mane mushroom, even if it's not entirely mature, triggers that process, which is known as deliquescence. So if you pick a bunch of these, take them home, put them in your fridge, after a day or two, you're just gonna have a pile of black goo. So you either wanna cook them as soon as you get home, or if you don't have time to do a whole recipe, get some water boiling and just blanch them in the boiling water for a minute or two, and that will stop deliquescence. And then you can sit on them for a couple more days and do whatever you're going to do with them. Um, and uh, so if you have anything else. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a little bit of black goo on the edge. It's not going to hurt you. Uh, just don't eat ones that are all black goo. All right. So that's that one. Um, like so compost fall favorite. But sometimes I see them growing in spring and summer in smaller amounts. But fall is the main time for the shaggy mane. All right, lobster mushroom. This is a special case. This is actually one fungus infected by another fungus. So the host is going to be either a lactarius or a rusula, one of those two genera. And then they get infected with this thing called Hypomyces lactiflorum. And if you cut that open, the red crusty part, that's your Hypomyces. Inside it's white. And that's your Lactarius arusula. And basically what the hypomyces is doing is hijacking that other mush, that other fungus to use its mushroom that's already grown to spread its spores. Now, not every arusula happens to be edible. But what's really cool about these is, um, so the things in a mushroom that can either make you sick or not sick are called metabolites. They're just sort of secondary chemicals they're not necessarily for life, but some of them are toxic to keep predators away, etc. And we, are, we can tolerate some metabolites and not others. So it just so happens we can tolerate the metabolites in, 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 in uh, hypomyces. If it infects a non-edible rusula, it, well, once that transformation is complete, it takes a few days, it changes the metabolites and the DNA so if you test the interior, that white interior, it's almost all going to come back as edible hypomyces. That's pretty cool. So these are mycorrhizal with, with conifers because that's what Rusula and Lactarius are mycorrhizal with. And you're generally going to find them late summer in the fall. Hedgehog mushroom looks a lot like a, a, a chanterelle, but it's got spiky bits on the underside, or, or maybe little icicles, if that's what you want to call them. But uh, anyway, look at the underside. That's going to tell you immediately it's a hedgehog. There's really nothing much like it. Uh, it bruises orange when cut. So this is an edible mushroom that bruises. And uh, you're going to find it. There's actually, you can find them year round. They're more common in fall. But there are species that fruit year-round. Uh, this is another one you want to pick earlier rather than later because they get bitter when they get older. But yeah, look for them any time of year. Uh, Yellowfoot used to be grouped with the chanterelles. Now it's got its own uh, genus. Looks a lot like a chanterelle, but like the, the um, cap is often a gray to brown rather than that bright yellow. They do have false gills rather than uh, the, the true ones. So the, the gills are kind of like they're carved rather than made of paper. Um, can grow on either soil or rotting wood. 
uh, mycorrhizal of conifers, especially Western hemlock and your Doug fir. And they'll start fruiting in late summer and they'll go well into uh, winter. You might actually find them uh, January, February. Here are a few poisonous mushrooms, just so you know what they look like. Uh, destroying angel, basically one great big white mushroom. And notice some of them have a very distinct cup at the bottom. Now, if that cup is buried under the grass or the, the, the what, you know leaf litter or whatever, and you cut your mushroom above that, you're not going to know that there's a cup there. And it's very common for this growing angel to happen. That's why I'm a big advocate for picking rather than cutting. In the same genus, but not as deadly, is your fly agaric, Amanita muscaria. This one won't kill you, but it'll probably make you wish you were dead for a while because you're going to throw up so much. <laughs> um, and there's actually a few toxic Amanitas that have the same color scheme where it's a, a background color, white. Uh, red, yellow, whatever, with white spots. All of them are toxic. Don't eat any of them. Red mouth belete. I don't know if you can see there, but it looks like it says not food on it. Uh, that wasn't done with a marker. That was actually someone took a stick and carved that into the mushroom and waited 30 minutes. It stains a very, very dark blue. So if you see a boletus mushroom with those pores, and it stains blue, don't eat it. Also, any belief that has those bright red or orange pores, avoid it. Jack-o'-lantern, that's a chanterelle look like. Notice that it has true gills that look like pages in a book. Um, but if you zoom out on that photo, it's actually growing on a dead tree. So whereas your chanterelles grow on soil. That's why it's so important to pay attention to the subspace if you eat those, again, Lots of throwing up. We don't want that. So, just as it's a good idea to avoid the big white mushrooms to keep from eating destroying angel, also a good idea to avoid your little dog mushrooms. Most of them aren't edible anyway. These two can kill you. Uh, the Codicide pilaris in particular, uh, there are a lot of people who have, not a lot, but you know, people who got poisoned with that usually mistake them for psilocybes. And they have a bunch of nostril. So, avoid your big white mushrooms, avoid your little white mushrooms. At least, or your big white, little brown mushrooms. Avoid both of those, um, at least so you have a little bit better idea of what you're doing. <clears throat> Death cap, that's just another big white mushroom. Sometimes it has, um, sometimes it has a little bit of a yellow or a green tint to the top of the cap. That's another one that will destroy your liver and kidneys. Uh, notice that it's got both a big cup and also a big ring around it. Now, not every specimen may have those. They may wear away. But if you notice those structures on a big white mushroom, pay attention. Uh, chlorophyllum looks kind of like a big cookie on a stalk. The gills, it's kind of hard to tell here, but they do have kind of a greenish tint. Um, that's another one. Just make me throw up all the time. You don't want it. And speaking of vomit, Rusula emetica. Emetic means vomit. What do you think it does when you eat it, huh? <laughs> so there are, there is at least one edible Rusula species that has a red cap and a white stipe. Uh, but it's tough to tell the difference between the species, especially after they've been out for a little bit and the color starts to fade, etc. So Rusulas are another one you probably want to wait until you have a little bit more experience. I'm so cautious with Rusulas. All right. Occasionally a mushroom will be in disagreement as to whether it's edible or not. Some people say some false morels are edible. Um, some people say if you cook fly garlic, the red and white one, correctly, that's fine to eat. My personal rule is unless, on, unless basically everybody agrees something is edible, I'm just not going to bother with it. There's so many other things I know that I can eat they're not going to make you sick. I'm just not going to take a chance. You know, there are, there are old mushroom hunters. There are bold mushroom hunters. There are no old, bold mushroom hunters. <laughs> I want to be an old mushroom hunter someday. All right, quick, real quick, foraging ethically. Never take more than 25% of a particular fungus in an area. Leave something for the wildlife. Leave something for the, the other mushroom hunters. 
Uh, be nice to the land. Don't go stepping on little animals or breaking branches or whatever. Leave no trace. Follow all federal and state regulations regarding mushroom harvest. They can vary from place to place. They can change over time. So if you're going to mushroom hunt on public land, check with whoever's in charge first. Don't forage on private Oh, and uh, make sure it's legal. See if you need a permit. And see if there's a limit on how much you can take. Uh, don't forage on private property. If someone's nice enough to share their property and you find mushrooms, don't go on Facebook and tell everybody else. At least not without permission. Uh, forage safely. Uh, you don't just have to worry about poisonous mushrooms. You also don't want to fall off a cliff. You know, that's kind of a bad day there. Um, you know, you don't want to get lost. You don't want to step on a snake. Uh, and if you're urban foraging, don't walk in front of a truck, okay? Bad idea. Uh, if you're going out to the wilderness, know where you're going. Take your 10 essentials of hiking and camping. You can find those online. Um, take a friend. You know, they can help you carry mushrooms. And if one of you gets hurt, the other one can go for help. Avoid foraging along busy roads. Fungi can absorb toxins from vehicles and other pollution sources. Uh, some urban areas can also have polluted soil. So just be cautious. Probably don't want to go mushroom hunting in an area that has a long industrial history, okay? Preserving what you found. Just real quick, there's no universal method. Uh, if you pick too much of one particular type of mushroom, you're going to have to research online what the best way to preserve that particular type of mushroom is. It's usually going to be either drying it or blanching and then freezing. But again, varies from mushroom to mushroom. Here are a few recommended books. The first two are two of my favorite field guides. Again, after class, you can come take a look at the other ones I have here, just the samples. Um, the last two there are just really fun reads on things like fungal biology. Uh, Radical Mycology is like a 500 page book on anything you can think of regarding fungi. Fungal biology, growing them, identification, etc. Mycelium Running by Paul Stamets. If you're interested in things like microremediation, using mushrooms to remove toxins from the environment, that's a really good book for that. Uh, a few recommended websites. Uh, I'll bring that. I'll bring this slide up again when we're done with the class, so you can write these down. The first two are basically online field guides. The the, the one in the middle, the Alpentel, that is a key, a dichotomous key that basically asks you questions about different traits and helps you narrow the mushroom down that way. Uh, the Oregon Mycological Society, really good organization to join. They do field trips, they're a great resource for asking questions, they do meetings, etc. And then if you like foraging and you want to try other outdoor uh, experiences, Rewild Portland is a nonprofit that does everything from foraging to uh, just various sorts of bushcraft. A few online groups. The first two Facebook groups and the Reddit group are all good social groups. So if you want to ask questions, post pictures of mushrooms you found, etc., that's a great resource. Poisons help. You eat a mushroom. It's making you sick. You're trying to decide whether you should go to the hospital or not. Post a picture of what you found, where you are, when you ate it, and what your symptoms are. And the, the administrators of that group are medical staff, mycologists, botanists, etc. They can help you figure out really quickly what you ate and how serious it is. Uh, oops, we're going to skip that real quick. Um, so, actually, uh, yeah, so real quick here, um, any final well, questions in a second, um, you're welcome to keep in touch with me. There's one of my email addresses. I have several. Uh, you can check out my website, RebeccaLexa.com. I have more information on coming classes. Uh, nature articles, I write a weekly nature article. Some of them are mushrooms. Um, if you want to follow me on social media, all my social media links are on that website. Uh, I do also have a monthly email list. And uh, you're welcome to keep up on news and updates that way. And yeah, let me bring back the uh, websites in case you want to get those copied down. So, um, do we have any final questions? So, what would your advice be for someone who is new to mushroom foraging and doesn't have a lot of patience? And 
So I've gone out sometimes with the intent, like seeing or finding mushrooms. Mm -hmm. I look around and I'm like, I don't know what I'm looking for, and then I just kind of give up. Um, so I get kind of frustrated too, because I read all this stuff online and mm -hmm. people are like, oh, I'm seeing you know, this and this pop up. And so yeah. I'm kind of like, that's what I'm going to look for. And then I go out and I can't find it and get frustrated. Um, I know this is going to be the hard thing, but try and hold me a little more patience. I know it's tough. Oh, yes. <laughs> I love it on that. Yeah, that's, so that's I just wondering if you have anything else to say. Uh, use the iNaturalist maps to try and narrow things down and join the Oregon Mycological Society. Because as you're talking to people and going on these field trips, uh, the field trips aren't kind of a lottery, but if you keep you know, applying, eventually you're, you're going to get in one. Plus going to meetings and stuff. And people we would give you more ideas of specifically where to go. So I think between the real people and also those maps, I think those will help maybe increase your likelihood. Okay. So the problem is not every patch is going to produce every single year. Last fall, most of my patches were in terrible condition because of the drought we got hit with in summer. The mycelium needs a certain amount of hydration to be able to move the nutrients around to build mushrooms, and they're just too dehydrated. So. You know, that's another unfortunate factor. But yeah, those are the two things I'd recommend. Anything else? So you normally, you don't, I always thought in my head that if I was going to go look for mushrooms, I always had to do it in the rains. That's not necessary. A day like this, I could go out. For what else? Okay. Now, in the fall, most of your fall mushrooms start showing up after the rains return. Okay. It just so happens that some of them, like in morels, some of your summer mushrooms, like your chicken in the woods, um, those don't necessarily have to have that big rain, but repeated drought, prolonged drought can make even drought tolerant species less productive. Um, you mentioned like when mushrooms get this kind of black, slimy, goo stuff. Just that one species, yeah. Oh, well, we have a lot of on my property, like what our natural things are red banded poly organs or something. Yeah. But they do like turn black on the top. That might just be out. getting infected by another fungus. Because oh, okay. there are a lot of cases of mushrooms getting infected by other fungi. So yeah, that's why it's going on. They're just getting black and bushy because they got other stuff. Fungi, bacteria, who knows? Anything else? Do you do the fungi ever are they like Territorial, like do you ever have different fungus, different types of fungus? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I find every the, the places where I find the fly agaric is also where I find a lot of king bleats, which is why I just don't bother keeping the fly agaric because I know the king bleats aren't going to make me sick. So, yeah, but then it, it's all wrapped up together the mycelium, the roots, everything that's in the soil just kind of intermingles. All right, anything else? Confusions, questions, comments? All right, quick bread and butter speech. I am self-employed. This is part of what I do for a living. Um, every quarter, I, I uh, write a different little chapbook. You know, 24 to 36 pages on some natural history topic. I do have one on winter foraging, uh, among other topics. If you are interested in these, they're $6 a piece. I can do cash. I can do card. You're also welcome to come up and take a, a business card and I'm a guided nature tour. Um, I'm a, I do guided uh, nature tours. So if you're interested in hiring me to go out in the woods with you and figure out what stuff is, I don't do just foraging tours. I do more cool ecosystem tours. But obviously, if you see something edible, I'll point it out. All right. Thank you so much for being willing to give me part of your afternoon on this beautiful day. And if you have questions later on, if you need further resources, drop me an email. My email's on my website, and I'm more than happy to help. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you.